gentlemen. Uh, my name is Eric Kaler. It's my honor to serve as the provost of Stony Brook University and to welcome you uh, to the event uh, today. Uh, this is one of the many events scheduled this week and next to welcome to our campus an accomplished educator, medical practitioner, and researcher, Dr. Stanley L. Uh, Samuel L. Stanley. You know, I knew I was going to do that, Sam. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Dr. Stanley is the fifth president of Stony Brook University. Before joining us in July, he was the vice chancellor for research at Washington University in St. Louis. He was educated at the University of Chicago and received his MD from Harvard Medical School in 1980. After completing his internship and residency at Mass General, he did postdoctoral work in immunology at Washington University. He subsequently joined the faculty there in the Division of Infectious Diseases in the Medical School, which is, as you probably know, one of the nation's most highly ranked schools of medicine. He has an outstanding reputation as a medical researcher and has published extensively. Administratively, during his time as Vice Chancellor for Research, Washington's university's sponsored research funding reached nearly $600 million annually. While Dr. Stanley has extraordinarily impressive credentials in the medical research arena, those of us who have worked closely with him here are equally impressed with his understanding of and commitment to the university. He fully understands the vast range of intellectual activity we undertake, from the arts and letter disciplines to the sciences and medicine, Dr. Stanley appreciates, supports, and backs the full development of our intellectual scope. There's no doubt that he will effectively lead our efforts to collaborate with partners, including Brookhaven National Lab and Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, to enable our next generation of successes. We have also found Dr. Stanley to be articulate, thoughtful, deliberative, and strategic in his approach, and he embraces a leadership style that lets people do their jobs. He really is a very good boss. This is an exciting time for Stony Brook, and I'm sure you join me in looking forward to Dr. Stanley's tenure, and I'm confident that his presidency will bring many new opportunities and successes to Stony Brook. Thank you again for joining us in this historic occasion for our university and for our new president. It's now my pleasure to welcome President Stanley to the podium. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much, Eric. It's um, you know one of my you know everybody has their little crosses to bear in life, and, and one is that I have two first names essentially. So I, I can't tell you the number of people who have referred to me as Stan or you know Stan Samley and, and other things. So this is you know don't feel bad at all, um, honestly. Um, well, this is a very special uh, uh, moment for me. Um, I've, I've truly been enjoying my uh, inauguration marathon, as I call it, um, and I'm not even halfway through yet, but, but it's, it's really been uh, a lot of fun. But I think there's, there's special meaning here. Um, as, as some of you may know, um, uh, my father's an anthropologist. Um, he's a cultural anthropologist, but I really grew up um, in a household where anthropology was the most important discipline in the world. I mean, I think that that's how we viewed it. Um, so that makes it particularly special um, for me to have the chance to introduce uh, our, our speaker um, for our lecture for today, Does Prehistory Matter in the 21st Century? So it, as I say, it's a special honor for me to introduce tonight's faculty speaker, who is really, I think, considered one of the world's most courageous and articulate advocates for wildlife and nature conservation. He's a paleoanthropologist, a wildlife conservationist, a pro-democracy activist, and professor of anthropology at Stony Brook, uh, Richard Leakey. While Leakey's name is well known throughout the world, I suspect few of you will know the full range of his accomplishments. Um, Richard Leakey is the second of three sons of uh, Lewis and Mary Leakey, world famous for their discoveries of early human fossils and stone tools at the Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania. Um, Richard was drawn to the same questions about human prehistory um, that occupied his parents, which led him to join an international paleontological expedition exploring the lower Omo Valley of southern Ethiopia in 1967. And during that field season, uh, Leakey, a trained pilot, took his now legendary supply flight from Nairobi to the camp over the region uh, to the east of Lake Turkana. And looking below, he saw what he thought might be fossil-bearing sedimentary rock. A brief reconnaissance trip to the region confirmed his suspicion. <laughs> 
Liga organized an expedition in 1968 to examine the eastern shore of Lake Turkana for humans, fossils, and artifacts. As he had predicted, the site proved to be a rich site um, in human fossils. It was even richer than he ever hoped to dream. In the four decades since Leakey initiated work on the shores of Lake Turkana, more than 200 human fossils have been recovered from these ancient sediments. This material has done more than any other collection to fill in our knowledge of human evolution from 4.0 million years ago to about 1 million years ago. Richard Leakey is without question the best known anthropologist living today. At the same time he began his work at Kubifora, the National Museums of Kenya was in the midst of a search for a replacement for the departing director. Leakey, having decided to pursue a career in paleoanthropology, applied for the post. Against his candidacy was his youth, a mere 23, uh, and, and to be candid, a little lack of formal education. He'd left high school um, prior to graduation and a lack of administrative experience. In his favor was the fact that he had opted to become a citizen of Kenya when the country achieved independence in 1963. His absolute enthusiasm, his fervent nationalism, and his very significant powers of persuasion. And I've experienced them. Uh, they, they, are, they are impressive. Um, when, when he took the job in 1968, the museum consisted of a few underfunded departments and employed a handful of people. By the time he departed the post in 1989, the institution had grown into one of the few museums in Africa that could claim international status as a research institution. He also helped formulate Kenya's antiquity laws, and he strove to ensure that Kenyan citizens were hired to fill positions, and he worked tirelessly to persuade Western philanthropic organizations to provide the museum with financial support. Leakey's tenure as director of National Museums of Kenya came to an end in 1989 when the president of Kenya uh, named him as director of the Kenyan Wildlife Service. In that capacity, he received worldwide acclaim for his endeavors to put a halt to the rampant poaching uh, that had decimated Kenya's elephant and rhino populations. In one of his first acts as director, he took a public stand in favor of a proposal to make illegal all international trade in ivory products. He carried on with his efforts, even after losing the lower half of both legs in a suspicious plane crash in 1993. But he came under increasingly bitter attack from his political enemies in parliament. In response, he submitted his resignation in January 1994. The president initially refused to accept it, but in March of that year, uh, Leakey resigned amid increasingly heated criticism from his political opponents. During the next four years, he devoted his energies to an effort to create multi-party democracy in Kenya. He founded an opposition party Party, Safina, and was elected a member of parliament. In 1998, under pressure from the World Bank, the president reappointed Leakey as head of the Kenyan Wildlife Service, from which position he quickly rose to become head of the Kenyan Civil Service and secretary of the cabinet, the number two political system in the Kenyan system. And he was there until he resigned in 2002, when the Kenyan parliament voted to outlaw his anti-corruption efforts. Truly a man of integrity and, and honor. Richard Leakey's achievements in the field of paleoanthropology, wildlife conservation, and politics are truly extraordinary. He was featured on the cover of Time magazine and was also featured in the top 100 thinkers of the 20th century. He's received many international awards and honors, uh, Hubbard Medal of the National Geographic Society, the Humane Society of the United States Joseph Wood Crutch Model, the Earthwatch Institute Conservation Award. He's received honorary doctorates from several universities of the United States and Britain, and he is a member of Sigma Chi, the Scientific Society of America, a Royal Anthropology Anthropological Institute Fellow, an Explorer Cubs Fellow, and a Fellow of the Institute for Cultural Research. He was elected a Fellow of the world's oldest scientific society, the Royal Society, in 2007. Richard Leakey joined the Stony Brook faculty in 2002. Together, Richard Leakey and Stony Brook University are spearheading the establishment of the Takana Basin Institute, which promises to revolutionize our approach to the discovery, to the recovery of the fossil evidence for human evolution. Now dividing his time between Kenya and Stony Brook, he inspires our student faculty alike with his extraordinary knowledge and love of life, and he continues tirelessly advocating for wildlife and nature conservation and speaking engagements all over the world. Before we begin, I want to remind you that there are no cards included with your program. If you have a question for Dr. Leakey, you can jot it down and pass the card to the end of the side aisle. Our students will pick them up at the end of the lecture, at which time Provost Kaler will conduct the Q&A. It is now my great honor to introduce some, someone I'm very proud to call my friend and our colleague at Stony Brook University, Dr. Richard Leakey. Well, good evening to all of you, and may I say right at the outset that I was surprised I'm slightly worried to have been asked to give this lecture because there are a great many more perfectly competent, in fact more competent people in the university itself who could have done this for the faculty. And I thought what would happen 
is I'd get a glowing introduction as I've just done, and then one would be embarrassed to open one's mouth because the fraudulence in some of the statements will become apparent very quickly. But let me proceed, therefore, with an editorial eye to the extent of what I say. Before I start, I would like to enjoin and be part of a very warm welcome and, and um, appreciation to, um, to uh, the new president, Sam, um, not Sam, it is Sam, Stanley. You see, you've confused me when you called yourself Manly or something. <laughs> You know, I got confused too. But I'm delighted that you're here. Uh, in our few meetings we've had, um, I found it extremely exciting to think of what you may do for here. And I guess I'm from another part of the world and I'm only here part time. But before I, I start, I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that you have come to a university that currently faces a lot of difficulties. But it is an extremely good university, uh, thanks to the efforts of the four previous presidents. And I have known it only over the last um, 202, 209, seven years. But during that time, I have personally witnessed a lot of changes and a lot of improvements and a lot of growth under your predecessor. And I think it would be inappropriate for me as a, a maverick not to recognize that both she and her predecessors have created a platform to which you really have a chance uh, to carry out some incredible tasks. And I think everybody in the university, I hope at any rate, uh, will be enthusiastic and keen to join you despite the difficulty that you face. And we are aware of the budget crisis. Um, there's not much faculty can do to help, but I think they will. And everything has an end. And you know, at the bottom of the trough, eventually it'll fill again. And we hope that you're right there filling it and then riding the wave of success uh, as we go forward. So I'd just like to recognize the previous presence and say a particularly um, warm appreciation for your being with us. Uh, you, I think you're absolutely the right person at the right time for the right job. And so I hope you'll all share in my sentiments with that regard. <laughs> Now, I was pressed to provide a title for this talk at a time when I was being pressed by a number of other things. And so I just thought very quickly and, and wrote down, is, is prehistory relevant in the 21st century? I think many of us, particularly faculty members, have, have taken easy routes to pressing problems and not given much thought to the consequences of those decisions. And the question of whether prehistory is going to be relevant in the 21st century is, is, is I'm not sure that it will be relevant. And, and I'm not sure it, w it will be relevant, not because it isn't relevant, because people don't listen and people don't learn. Um, and I think there's a lot, of, a lot of problem with those sort of rhetorical questions. However, I think prehistory, and I use the term prehistory rather than anthropology, because I think it is important to recognize that in the European old world sense, prehistory is a much uh, more encompassing and, and, and deeper issue that is not anthro-focused. And I think the, the paleoecology, the context of evolution, the, the physical side of evolution, the, the adaptive uh, biological adaptations, the association with other biological um, groups, uh, and the interpretation of how the mix could have produced circumstances that could have led ultimately to the appearance of ourselves is what's of interest. And um, I think it's, it's, it's a little broader, and I think of a far greater relevance than simply anthropology, which is obviously the core of the whole story. Anthropology has been, as many of you know, but I will just repeat, um, important to, to the world in, in, in the, both the 19th century particularly, also the end, sort of halfway through the 18th century. And for a number of years, uh, some of the horrendous um, practices of European um, policy in terms of colonialization was justified by uh, talking to anthropologists and say, uh, in the early days, we're, would go so far as to say, but you're not really uh, 
taking people's land, you're taking a lesser people's land. And, and, and that was ultimately agreed that they were people. Um, but then the Christians got onto it and said, but they don't have souls, so you're not doing a bad thing yet. If you can get them a soul, then you can go forward. And some awful things have happened in the, in the history of mankind. Um, and in the last couple of hundred years, anthropology has played a key role in justifying some of the, the, the policies that were taken by these organizations. Um, since Darwin first published his, his uh, seminal work, The, uh, the Origin, um, 150 years ago, um, the other central question, which is quite topical today, is the relationship between us and it's becoming less so the other people, whoever us is. And I think one should recognize it's not just people of, of European or, or um, Caucasian origin who think of other people as odd. I think the other people think Caucasians are very odd. And in Kenya, the term Zungo, which describes uh, people who've got fair skin, um, Zungo means people who've got a head that is constantly going round and round. They don't know what they're doing. And, and so we're uh, not necessarily affectionately referred to as the Wazungu, people whose, whose heads spin. I don't know how they know how much it spins, but it does. Um, the, the, the other key question, and it's strange having said that, that people think of us all as different when we are all the same. And, and in a moment or two, I'll just touch very briefly on some of the the hotspots that I think the 21st century will address, it, it is a strange thing to say that as, as recently as, as um, 1975, six, seven, I was doing a lot of fundraising for the Institute in Nairobi. And I remember going to Atlanta and uh, I was received by a very well-connected family who would put me up as their guest and they were going to supervised some fundraising events for me and they were very very kind to me and um, one afternoon we had some spare time and I sat next to the pool on the deck with uh, the hostess her husband had gone to do something else and the two of us were sitting there talking and she leaned over and she said Richard do you really believe that we're all the same I said what do you mean and she said well Surely you haven't been duped too. You're much too smart to think that we and, and people from Africa belong to the same species. And I said, good Lord, woman, what are you talking about? <laughs> of course I believe it, we are. And she says, no, she says, we can't be. And I said, why can't we be? And she said, and this was 1976. She said, well, have you noticed that the African cannot swim? I said, well, frankly, no, I haven't noticed. Um, but if it's so, it, you know, there must be a reason such as they've never had an opportunity to swim. <laughs> Not that they can't. No, 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 she said. They've got an extra bone in their foot that prevents them from flapping their ankle properly. I said, really? And then I said to her, you know, you are the most misguided, misinformed, stupid woman if you're passing this information on. But this was in 1976. And where that came from, I don't know. And you know, on all other counts, she passed well. But on that one, I must say, I was shocked. Um, and I think you all would have been too. But that's as recent as it was. Now, I think the other question that I wanted to touch on, and, and I, I think it's, it's much um, less relevant, but I wonder whether it's not playing a certain part in the backs of people's minds, and, and that is our relationship to the apes. And the recent discovery of Ardipithecus, or publication of Ardipithecus, unfortunately it's not a recent discovery. It's very anciently found, 17 years ago. But there a lot of play has been made on this being not a chimp, but our ancestor. And the inference there is that the chimp isn't our ancestor, and therefore somehow we've sanitized an early part of the story. And people have often asked about the missing link, and I think they expected to find a link or a fossil or a series of fossils that was sort of half-half. And obviously it doesn't work that way in anything, 
But that goes back to just after Darwin's publication that people are looking for the missing link. And many of you may not remember, and this is a long time ago, and, and I don't know what, what people uh, read in their spare time, but in England, there was um, sufficient talk around this in, in um, Oxford and in, in University of London and at Cambridge that some students, we think it was students, planned a little hoax on their professor who was absolutely convinced that the missing link would be found and it would be half ape and half chimp, no, half, half, half chimp and half human. And they got together some modern bones, fairly heavy ones, and they stained them with tea and, and browning stuff and they buried them in, in a quarry and then sort of gradually over the next few months pushed him out so he could find them. And this was the famous Piltdown Man and indeed it was a chimpanzee jaw and parts of a human skull. It was just what they expected. And I don't think it was intended to go further than a joke but when the professor fell hook, line and sinker and gobbled this up and wouldn't let anyone see it again because it was so important to Imperial Britain to also not only rule the waves, but to have the first humans justifying the position, that an awful lot of people took a lot of solace and, and, and strength from the fact that a half ape, half human had been found in Great Britain and that this would really establish Britain as the, the center of the world, which they acted as if it was. And as you know, it's not quite in the middle, but it's, uh, it's somewhere on this planet. So, so I just thought I'd mention that because it's important. The other thing that I think is, is worth noting, which some of you may not have heard, is that in, in, in Europe in the, um, in the 30s, there's a lot of preoccupation, particularly under, under um, the German regime, when Adolf Hitler came into power, to, to try to, to sanitize just the Aryan race and to put everything else off on the side. And one of the things we came across recently was that a German professor, and I A, don't remember the name, and B, if I did, I wouldn't necessarily bring it up, but he got money from the government to go off to um, a country in West Africa, which I think was under... German administration at the time, or French administration, and he was sufficiently persuasive that he was able to capture about 24 chimpanzees. And his intention was to set up a laboratory in West Africa where he would cross chimpanzees with humans. And he wanted to see if you could, in his misguided way, actually bring back to life something that is half ape, half human. And um, there's not a great deal in the, in the literature that, that attests to the outcome of this, but I d did learn that he, he, he wasn't a very good keeper of animals, and, and a good number of these unfortunate chimpanzees died. Um, I think there was no question of the participants agreeing or not agreeing. They were local Africans from the region who were simply captured for the purposes of a laboratory uh, experiment and they were treated as if they were not really very human anyway and therefore there were no rights involved in, in, in breaching this. He um, finally was ordered back to Germany because the imminence of the World War II breaking out was, was clear to everybody and he went back with his remaining chimpanzees being quite satisfied that he would find people to cross with his remaining chimps. And the implication is, irrespective of whether they were willing or not, and I don't need to go down that road, you all know where that road ultimately led to, and the strong political justification that was, was garnered for the mistreatment on an incredible uh, scale of the Jewish people and, and then other people, the gypsies and others in, in, in Germany at that time. This was in, in the 40s. Uh, not very long ago. And again, it was backed up by this belief that anthropology needed to answer some fundamental questions. I'm curious as to why, um, and I, I don't want to talk a lot about it because there will be an opportunity for a few questions, and frankly, I, I'm not a particularly ex good expert in this area. But as you know, last week there came out a, 
um, a paper in science, or 11 papers in science, that described and, and, and discussed the relevance of a new skeleton that has been named Ardipithecus ramidus. And amongst the pieces was a female skeleton, a remarkably complete, at least in pen and ink drawings. Um, there's a lot of pieces there, but I think a lot of it was was mirror imaged and, and digitized and put together because it was squashed pretty flat. But uh, the, the view of, of the authors was that this was really the, the true ancestor, that 4.4 million years you have something that is, that is half human in some respects and going towards, uh, but some ape characteristics creeping through. Now I think a number of us were quite appalled at, at what we read and saw. Um, and one would, one would not want to debate this because I haven't seen the original specimen. But what I do think it, is it, it implies almost a mindset. It implies almost a, a, a hidden prejudice that the people may still have in them, that have this feeling that we need to separate our ancestry from living apes. Of course, for those of you who, who periodically think of this issue, um, if, if you use your logic, it wasn't an ape that gave rise to a human because a human is an ape. And, and, and this, the separation or the, the sort of spring away from being ape hasn't occurred and won't occur because we are just another species of ape that has been through many manifestations in, in its development and one had the good fortune or the skills to come through to the modern age, and, and as we've isolated ourselves from our ancestors, we consider ourselves more and more special from everything that was behind us. And yet, you know, it's not really an ape giving rise to a human. I mean, it's, it's a question of a human attaining the human characteristics that we recognize as human, as opposed to those who aren't. But it's not really such a big jump to go from a chimp to a human or, or another ape. And it doesn't need to be a chimp. There are a huge number of, of fossil apes back in 15 to 12 million year period that haven't really been looked at. And I guess one of the most interesting things is the origin of bipedalism, because in many ways, and for many people, this is what defines being human. That having our hands perpetually free from the, 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 the need to support our bodies either on the ground, or with our flat hands, knuckle walking or climbing on trees, swinging below them as, as the living apes do today. And this must have happened um, quite early. We have footprints at Lytoli that, that whether or not it was just like us, but it was clearly a striding biped because they're footprints that stride and and there are only two feet on each individual, as far as we can see. And you can read up a lot of literature on that. But it has, it has a foot. Obviously, I doubt if it would be like ours, but not that much unlike ours. But it didn't have what the chimps have. And, and they have third and fourth hands in their back legs. And a chimp can use its feet just as well as it can use its hands to grasp and hold and, and, and pull things. And we don't have that. It, one of the reasons it, 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 it is so good at, in the trees is that it has a big toe that sticks out, an opposable, a, not a non-opposable, but a, but a huge big flange that comes out. So that when you, when you grasp, you can grasp like that. Whereas we can grasp, but, but, but habitually, I'd, foot is not very good at grasping anything. You may notice that babies try to grasp your finger with their feet. Uh, this must be something in, in the early development stages, but they're not very good at hanging on with their feet. But a, a young chimp, you could have him or her grasp your finger and you could lift it up as a, quite a small baby. But with humans, our feet just don't do this. So when, when some of us read this paper that said that these feet, of which they have quite good fossils, apparently, uh, can be explained as, as good evidence for bipedalism, I think some of us thought, well, what can you say? <laughs> Let's leave it there. The only other point I want to make um, is that several people have asked me, including members of the press, as to whether I accept the conclusions that uh, the group of scientists have presented. And I think the answer would be, um, depends which conclusions. 
That is a hugely important fossil, no question. That it will shed light on many questions we've been asking, no question. But do I agree it's a hominid or, or, or on the line to, uh, to hominids? I see no evidence of that at all. And I don't think it fits there. And I think it's a fundamental error. And I think over the next year, we will all read in the popular press as well as the scientific press a, a series of quite stinging uh, rebukes and arguments about the interpretation of these fossils, which is a pity because the fossil itself is of such value and such interest. And we really shouldn't get wound up about a hominid or a non-hominid. We should be much more interested in the science of understanding what the specimen represents in terms of bioecology bio and, and things of that kind. So enough on Ardipithecus, but for those of you who've wondered what I thought, uh, I don't think it's a hominid. And I think uh, a, a lot of damage has been done to the credibility of physical anthropology with the publication of something that clearly hasn't been critically reviewed uh, in that question. So I just leave it there. So let's get back to the title, the, uh, the relevance or irrelevance of, of prehistory. There are still a number of questions that we face, and, and I think prehistory can still play a big role in, in building the human psyche and the, and the human identity. I think a lot of people play lip service to, to the one species idea that we're all together, we all come from something 65,000 years ago, thereabouts, a small population in Africa. Uh, they all sort of quite happy, well not necessarily happy, but prepared to pretend that they don't think themselves different from people from China and people from Africa. And, and uh, people from Africa and China and far other places don't necessarily think that, that the, the whiteies are, are, are the same as them, but it's, it seems to be a sort of thing to accept these days. How deeply a fix that is in people's minds, I don't know. And I think there is a, a great value in, in over the next 15, 20, 30 years of really looking at the last 100,000 years, maybe 200,000 years, of human development um, that took place uh, in different parts of the world, but the key elements of this story were probably found in Africa, where we will find um, well-preserved fossils in stratified deposits that begin around 200,000 when we know there is a Homo sapiens. Um, a team from Stony Brook followed up on work that I did in 67, led by uh, John Flegel, Professor John Flegel, who's at this university, and a team from, from associated with him, went back to the site I found, found some additional pieces, and on the basis of the additional pieces, um, they also had with them uh, people who could do some more um, modern dating, looking at geology and looking at samples taken from the stratification uh, sediments. And they came up with a date of 195, 198,000 years for this Homo sapiens. So Homo sapiens, a modern human form, goes at least that far back. Somewhere between then and now, a number of events have happened that I think really need some, some, some research. And if we could find enough evidence, I think it would become much easier to persuade school teachers and school boards and parent associations to teach it. And, and that because we're now talking about us. Uh, we're not talking about a, a funny, furry thing that, that um, bones may suggest are related to us. But they're actually us anyway. And, and I think a lot of the prejudice and the mind shutting that takes place could be put aside. And I think the, the recent work that's been done on, on biogenetics and, and the, the sort of unraveling of the genome and, and the new work that's being done on, on sampling people, you can get your own history from a swab in the mouth that's done by people like Genographic and other people. And more and more people are coming up to me and say, well, you know, you seem to be right. We did come from Africa. Even I came from Africa, they say. Can you imagine that with blue eyes and flaxen hair? Yeah, and probably not that long ago. And they said, well, you know, what, what then happened? What led to it? Um, and I think there is a treasure trove to be discovered in terms of the last 200,000 years that will eventually lead to a much better understanding about us, how we relate to each other, how we've related to, paleo, to, to climate change, how we've related to a number of things that, that are still with us and we will get a better understanding. So I think that the last um, 200,000 years has to be one of the priorities in the 21st century. And you know, the 21st century is not left now nearly 90 years 
Most people say, well, that's an awfully long time. Well, it's a long time, but is it a long time in 65,000 years? And is it a long time in 4 million years? And I think we've got to be a little more realistic about time slots. And I think this is one of the difficulties we all face in many things, in that we are, are it's like sound bites. We, we have time bites. And, and we find it very difficult to conceive of a project that may take 50 to 100 years to complete. And if we're going to sort out the world's climate problems, we can't fix alternative energy in the next 10 years. It's going to take a long time. But unless you start, you never finish. And unless you commit to a long term, you'll never get where you're going. And so I think this is the same in, in, in prehistory research that, that needs to be done. The other major gap in our, in our knowledge about the past, and, and one which I think is equally possible to fill, is what is the link between these, these apes that are known from the Mars scene back at 12, um, 14 million years, with the later Australopithecines and humans, pre-humans and humans that occur in Africa and in Asia. Frankly, the, the people working on the Marcine apes have, have started at the other end of the story. And most of us in prehistory and, and, and anthropology have started at, at now, our end of the story. And we're now getting into sort of spongy ground because we don't have the fossils to tell us how this thing might fit in terms of, of earlier adaptations. The, the number of, of fossils that have been found in different parts of the world relating to that time period is far more extensive than anyone would imagine. And I think we've got to start looking at that, looking for clues, and then trying to figure out with the detail that we have for the later periods, what sort of ecology these, these early apes were living in? What, what was their adaptation? What, was the, what were they doing? Were they all swinging around on lianas? Or hanging under branches? Or shrieking their heads off in the canopy? Or were some of these large, larger apes, particularly the large-bodied apes, doing things which their postcranial may tell us indicates a trend in terms of development of one or several species? I think one of the things we want to do here at TBI, with, with the support of Stony Brook in particular, but other teams from other parts of the world, is focus in on those two major areas. There are still many things that have to be found um, to answer all the questions in the four to one million year period. Um, new finds are coming, and there are new discoveries in South Africa, um, there, there are new discoveries even in Kenya, which I'm not at liberty to talk about. Uh, because my wife is here and she's very strict about disclosing pillow talk. So um, all I can say is that we're, we're, we're in for some very exciting uh, debate and discussion uh, on, on three fronts. Filling in what we have with more detail. Uh, filling in, I think the most important issue for me is who we are and where we came from and possibly relating us through genetics uh, to actual modern people who have survived in Africa and, and looking at that. And if you could link those two together, I think you would have a totally different mindset. And, and I think this would be terribly important for the world. I think it would be terribly important, dare I say it, I think I dare, and that is it would be terribly important for Africa. And Africa is one of those, those uh, continents, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, that probably took as much um, damage from pre-colonial and colonial European interests as any part of the world. I know South and Central America had their share of, of disasters. Um, the evidence in, in much of North America has been swept over, so you can't really see the terrible things you did to your indigenous people here. But in Africa, there's still scars, there's still evidence. And I think if, if, if you wanted to characterize one of the problems that African leadership has, is that they're very conscious of the fact that they're way behind everybody else and they're, they're, they're always on, on looking for help. And I think if you could establish to a point where it was absolutely not debatable, the link between everybody today and people in Africa, and you could really drive home the Homo sapiens origin as an African event, 
and then you could link that to other things, I think you'd have a big impact on global affairs, and I think that is worth considering. The other thing that I think is, is, is coming out of this, and, and one which, again, uh, we're quite interested in some joint programs with various universities, but we're beginning to see some, some scope for developing this quite early on with, with some of the Stony Brook uh, faculty, and that is to look at, at the relationship between climate change and evolution. Uh, what precipitates these changes? We, we, we have been fed a diet of global warming is the issue. Uh, recent work suggests that in, in um, Lake Turkana, where many of these fossils have been found in the sort of eastern rift of Africa, the temperature range, the mean temp annual temperature range, probably hasn't changed more than one degree up or one degree down over four million years. And yet over four million years, huge changes have happened to, to, to the various species, and, and they must have been forced by the need to change one's adaptation to meet new ecological opportunity and challenges. We've had a series of conferences. We talk about, you know, were these creatures living in, 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 in the trees or the grass? Were they in woodland or savannah? And, and anthropologists and prehistorians tend to say, well, it was a sort of semi-closed habitat with some trees and some grass. And, you know, it's a complete fudge. We have no idea what's going on. And I think we, we've been looking at the wrong thing. And we, we, we've been accepting that, you know, there must have been periods of of, of warming and, and making all this very difficult. But the more I look at it and think about it, and I think I'm, I'm not at the front of the, the, the group that is saying this, but I think in the last couple of years you will see a lot more of this. Um, it's, it's less to do with warming in Africa that led to the evolution of species such as our own, but more to do with the events elsewhere that have affected precipitation in Africa. And I think it's the, 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 the response of vegetation in Africa to directional monsoons, to seasonal trade winds, to um, polar melts one end or the other, causing the ocean to change its currents. And I think it's the, the absence of certain critical parts of the food chain that lead to this adaptive um, response. And I think we need to start looking quite closely at, at what we can learn less about temperature and far more in Africa about precipitation. And this is a particularly difficult thing to get at. And at the moment, there's very little information known about when, when the, 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 the horse's equus first arrived in Africa two million years ago, thereabouts. Did they get in because there was no more, or there was now for the first time the things that they needed to, to feed on? Uh, what are the temperature ranges where those grasses exist? What are the, her the ranges of herbs that different species are dependent on? There's a lot we can learn, and, and I don't think we've really got into this at all deeply so far. And I think this would be both useful in understanding us, but I think it might also be very useful in understanding us in the context of the 21st century, because certainly the ice caps are melting. Uh, I don't think that's in dispute anymore, although I hear that on Fox News, at least once a day, you'll hear it disputed. But be that as it may, uh, they haven't been right on everything, and I think that's one area where they're probably wrong. Um, so I, th I think there are people who still don't accept this. There are other happy folk who say, well, it's all happened before. And you say, yes, it's, that's why we're worried. It's not that if it hadn't happened before, we have no idea where we're going. But it has happened frequently before, and we know the consequences of what happened. But we've never seen it happen when there were 7 billion people going to 12, dependent on certain vegetation for their basic food. And if you recall, I haven't got the exact figures at my fingertip, but rice and corn and, and wheat and, and perhaps uh, potatoes are the principal diet for millions and millions and millions and millions of people. And they've been so carefully selected and bred for maximum production that a blight or something that, that weather change, precipitation or otherwise, might cause could eliminate 90% of the human diet uh, in a few years.
Yeah, I don't think it would affect those living in Long Island. I think you're going to get sunk in, in, in the rising seas. But I think you're, you're, the world is going to be a mess if they can't get their corn and their, their rice and their wheat. And I, I think that there are aspects of the past, even though we don't really learn from history, let alone from prehistory, that we must still try to teach about in the hopes that some will learn and some will, will, will recognize uh, where we're going. So, you know, what more can I say? Do I think it's relevant? Indirectly, I think it's very relevant. Um, would I give it priority over, over feeding the hungry? I would, I'm not a fudger, but I would fudge and say, well, one of the ways to make sure that hungry are always fed is to understand what um, prehistory tells us about climate change and cereals and, and crop production and, and what this has done in the past in terms of, of uh, temperature. So it, it might be a great mistake to abandon lessons of, of prehistory uh, in the face of the growing crisis that, that exists today. And um, we see national parks in, in many parts of the world threatened. Um, in Kenya today, East Africa, the destruction of wildlife through drought has been uh, unprecedented in historical memory. Hundreds of thousands of animals have died within species. They will recover. But was last year's drought or this year's drought the worst we can expect? Or are there possibilities of much longer periods of desiccation? And you know, you can, you can wander off in, in retirement and, and take a drive through the Sahara. And up in the northern part of the Sahara, you can find um, rock shelters where people have, have both painted and, and done petroglyphs of scenes that are reminiscent of the Serengeti today with huge herds of animals and giraffe and lion and, and all of these things. And that was the Sahara as we know it today is a very recent phenomenon, seven, eight thousand years, no more. Um, lakes that were along the length of the Eastern Rift Valley, including Lake Turkana, um, four or five hundred feet higher than they are today, dropped quite suddenly. People say it could be brought about by tectonic activity. I'm sure in part it was, but I think in, in, in other areas it may be just it wasn't raining. And as a consequence of those drops, various things happened. So I, I think prehistory has a relevance. Uh, I think it should be more than just dem bones and stones. I think, I think the archaeology and, and, and um, anatomists and physical anthropologists need to, to be part of a much broader investigation where we can link all these things together. And um, I don't know, I, I see colleagues in anthropology here and I, I would just say that reading that famous paper in Science last week, one thing that somebody said to me in California who rang me and said, well, that person has never even seen a wild animal to write the sort of tiffle that he's put in this paper. Um, the sociobiology implications of that paper were incredible. And one has to give um, recognition to science for having been sufficiently blinkered to let something like that come out in the press. And I, I, th I really do think, particularly those of you who are members the AAAS, who I understand, own science. Why don't you complain? Why don't you have a censure motion and, and demand an investigation as to how that got through? You know, people more and more don't want to complain, don't want to say no. And the New York Times man, John Wilfred Noble, rang me a couple of days ago, and he said, do you think um, Ardy is a hominid? And I said, no. He said, are you serious? I said, yes. He said, you know, the first person to have said that to me. I said, well, how many people have you talked to? He said, about 10. I said, well, I've talked to about 25, and you're the first person who believes it. <laughs> so you can take that away and think about the implications of what I'm telling you. Uh, there is a story that needs a probe, in my judgment, as to how this came about. But let us not in any way disparage the value of an incredible discovery and, and, and uh, I wouldn't wish to do that, and I know that um, Professor White will be here next week talking in a symposium, and I wouldn't want him to leave thinking that I think his fossil is of no value. I think it's one of the most important things ever found. I think some of the words that come with it need to be revised, that's all.
But, you know, there it is. And, you know, it would be so much easier if every fossil had a label when we found it <laughs> that was writ somewhere else. I mean, then we could go. Well, we would probably argue, too, as to whether it was a fraudulent label, but at least we would we'll have a step forward. So let me stop there. I want to end at 6. Um, I'd be very happy to take 10, 15 minutes of questions, if you have any. I'd perfectly understand it if you have none, and simply want to get out of this mad situation you found yourself in this afternoon. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, for a very interesting talk, as, as always. Uh, if you do have questions uh, on cards and they're making their way down, thank you. It's an easier way to manage the, uh, uh, the flow. Um, I'll start you off with uh, a fastball in honor of baseball. Um, the question is, do you believe that the concept of God can fit into anthropology and science in the 21st century? Just repeat, this is, I must turn my good ear to you, and that's not very good either, so will you say that again? Do you believe that the concept of God can fit into anthropology and science in the 21st century? I think you would have to do what is probably impossible, and that is redefine God. And I think that would be difficult to do. And I would like to make it very clear, do I believe in a supernatural or divine or... Um, an ultimate um, intelligence that is responsible for the Big Bang and all things thereafter. No, I don't. I think it's a purely human need to have somebody responsible. Do I despise or look down on people who have a strong faith? Not at all. Many of my friends have a strong faith. Muslim, as well as Christian. And I have uh, many good friends who, like me, have no faith in any sort of religion and, and look for a, a, a rational explanation for, for the world that they find themselves in, which is where I would fit. Uh, it's, it's again an interesting thing. This, this um, same debate came up in relationship to discussions after Darwin's work. And so many people who were studying uh, evolution and geology were introduced as, as atheists. And I think that the, the group then got a little bit irritated as to what atheists meant. And, and they formed a society which still exists, and I'm one of the honorary presidents of this society. It's a global society, and it's called the Rationalist Society. And the Rationalist or, or, or Society believes in, in um, rational explanations and, and puts very high store in human, human attitudes in terms of interrelationships and our relationship with the planet and environment and things of that kind. And our, our, if, if, if we have a dogma, which I don't think we're supposed to have, it's an awe of life itself rather than uh, an entity that we can pray to, never get a direct answer to, and you hope for the best. And I think we find that difficult. But that's a very personal view, and I don't mean to offend anybody who finds it easier to, to go home and believe. I mean, I, I respect that enormously. I just don't belong in that camp, and I think it's time we, we said some of these things in an in open forum. You have spoken about uh, the evolutionary pressures that led to uh, creation of, of the human species. What do you view the evolutionary pressures that will lead to the species that we evolve into? And what is the time scale for that kind of evolution? As to what's next? What's next? Well, here one is almost inclined to, to invoke the divine authority because <laughs> <laughs> nothing could be more appalling to think of anything <laughs> after us who can wreak as much damage as we have. Um, I think that and it's a theoretical position that I've heard argued by people who know better, but I think from a theoretical point of view, for a species to evolve with a generation length of ours, which is 15, 20 years when you first come into reproduction, um, you would need to isolate a part of the human population, a relatively small part of the human population, and stress them with, with whatever the stresses are that they have to face, and they might, if you gave them 100,000 years, show some form of adaptation to the new circumstance. 
But you couldn't even imagine separating the work of a small group of people out of the, the, the mainstream of humanity in 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 a hundred years, let alone a thousand years. And in a thousand years, you're not going to see anything. So people say, well, you know, we're, we're now producing successful mothers who have narrow hips. <laughs> yes, we are, but how many? And are they going to have an impact on the species? The answer is no. Caesareans are not done all over the world. Natural birth is the norm for 95% of the world's population. And um, there is a cutoff point in which if you have two narrow hips and you have a mate who's given you a baby that's likely to be quite large, the, the chances are in most of the population the baby dies in childbirth or the mother dies with the baby in childbirth. This is not a good thing, but it's difficult to conceive of, of fixing that at a scale that would give us any opportunity for further evolution. And, and I think it's improbable, if not impossible. However, let us not take solace from that, um, even if we don't evolve, which I think we won't, other things continue to, and uh, we, we are very foolish if we think if our evolution is over, it must be over for everything. Talk to people who work on bacteria and, and viruses, and that's what may give us our biggest shock in life, that evolution does work. And my God, we've lost 90% of the population. That is a different issue, but it's again evolution that's taking place with the um, agricultural crops, it's evolution that's taking place with the new viruses that affect us, and we, we're all rushing around like chickens with their head cut off trying to get vaccine for the flu. That swine flu is not a nice thing and it's going to kill quite a lot of people in probability, but it's not going to wipe out the species. But there could come along something that is much more virulent. I mean, swine flu is, is a sort of a curmudgeonly uncle <laughs> compared to what is potentially available to knock us off our feet. And so I think we need to be much more realistic than we are. Okay. Social question for you. Some have explained that the attacks on President Obama from the right are veiled racism because he is half African. Obama denies this. What is your view? Well, I don't think he denies he's half African. <laughs> I'm just reading the question, not okay, tracing well, the like antecedents. To, I'd like to clarify that. But um, he wasn't born in Kenya, as people have suggested, and, and we're absolutely certain of that. And that was a, a classic sort of, well, uh, let me not say too much, but no, that's a non-starter. Non um, do I think that there is an opposition to Obama because he's, people are racist? You'd have to be very naive to think otherwise. Uh, there are some deeply rooted ideological positions on, on um, whether or not the state should own public health opportunities and whether the state should do some of the things it does. But, you know, one man, no matter who he is or where he came from, it can't turn the United States into a socialist communist republic in four or eight years. I mean, that is the one thing you've achieved, and that you've achieved a level of democracy and representational uh, uh, law that makes that an impossibility. And I think that's just a, it's an absolutely um, non-starter. But do I think people are still racist, and some of them may be inherently driven by that and say they just can't bring themselves to deal with this? Well, from what I've seen reported, and, and some of the people I've talked to at fundraising dinners, I'd have to say there are quite a few of them still, and you know, um, I don't think everyone is racist at all, but it's something that's been with the, 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 not just the white race. I mean, yes, the white race is very racist, but I think others are very racist, and I think we need to recognize that. Um, you know, we, we hear huge complaints that um, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to settle in a country like Kenya, if, unless you're Kenya born and Kenya raised. But you can, you can get citizenship. Uh, try it in, in, in uh, China, try it in Japan, or try it in some of the Southeast countries, South America. They're much stronger in terms of keeping their, their gene pool intact. So I, people are racist, they will be for some more time. I think the more we can not, um, not take too much concern from that and let the good man who's running this country, whoever is, get on with the substantive issues, not the, not the minutiae that, that are so distracting. 
Occupational therapists have studied primate daily occupations, including how they live and function. What have you learned in your work about daily occupations of primates prehistorically? Well, I have to say, <laughs> we can learn very little about behavior from fossils. Um, behavior, although contemporary experiences would perhaps lead you to another conclusion, behavior doesn't fossilize. Um, and it's very hard to come up with an explanation as to what, what prehistoric primates might have done or not done. We can only draw um, from modern analogues. And, and, and if you've got a, an ancestor to a, a colobus monkey, which is a leaf-eating, largely arboreal monkey, although there are some terrestrial ones, you would look to the social behavior within the colobus living today to draw some, some in conclusions as to what these animals were doing then and what they might have eaten and things like that. Uh, the difficulty is with humans because it, it's very hard to envisage us, except in very isolated populations that have been peripheralized, as being, doing anything like our ancestors must have done. And, you know, what is the norm of humanity? Is it here in Long Island? Or is it in the deepest recesses of the South American um, Amazon Basin or Southeast Asia? Is it the people in Central Australia? What is the norm? And, and is the world that they're now living in what it was when our ancestors were living somewhere entirely different? And I, but you can begin to infer from archaeology and the manufacture of implements um, some more information than you might expect, but I don't think they're modern analogues to prehistoric ancestors that I know of. Okay. This is a more technical question. Given that early hominoids had to evolve bipedalism and high intellectual ability in order to survive some hypothetical environmental changes, do you think that inter interbreeding of originally separate lineages with appropriate mutations resulted in one human lineage, or were the mutations in the same lineage? I would think, out of necessity, they would have to be in the same lineage. You'd have to define the lineage that you're talking about to, to, to get there. But, you know, the necessity of developing high intelligence. Why? How many dumb people do we know even today? <laughs> <laughs> you know? No, it's, it's not a prerequisite to being human. Um, I think to be a modern human, it's, good, it's, it's, it's useful to have articulate speech. But have you listened to, to the sort of chatter at, at the, the, the dining halls and colleges? And, and, and you wonder, you know, these people are talking about baseball and, and basketball and this ball and the other ball. And there's, everybody's like this and like that. I mean, there's no, there's no dialogue in many, many of our young people today. And I'm not sure there's very much dialogue uh, that requires intelligence in the heartland of America. I mean, uh, intelligence isn't a prerequisite. It helps to escape, if you like. So, um, bipedalism. I mean, we've got countless fossil lineages or species that had quite small brains and became extinct. Did they become extinct because they had small brains, or did they become extinct because they couldn't adapt quick enough to the changes that they faced? Was our lucky break the fact that we were already starting to make things with our hands that accessed more easily a different diet. That's likely, but I think we still have a long way to go to, to f confirm that. And the final question is uh, from someone who uh, will be able to come to Stony Brook in seven or eight years. Uh, he's 10, and he wants to know if you brought any fossils with you. <laughs> no. Um, the reason I didn't is that, that a number of us believe that original fossils, which are so precious to humanity, should not be subjected to the risk of travel. And these things can't ever be replaced. And it's, it's in, a, in, a, in a real heritage sense, they're the property of the world, and, and nobody has the right to subject them to any form of risk whatsoever. And international travel today, while it's not particularly risky, does carry rather more risk than if you're locked up in a bank vault somewhere where you stay for the rest of time. So we don't carry fossils around. We often carry uh, replicas of fossils, plastic casts. But um, no, I very rarely talk about fossils anymore. My wife does that. But I was persuaded tonight. And my wife is here. And she's doing all the scientific work with our daughter. And uh, Meve is, is normally traveling 
with many replicas of different fossils, but not to show us, but to show smart people who'd like to talk about fossils. So that's it. Richard, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.